I think I think we're at an unprecedented time, and I think it's I think it's pretty fair to say that New York might be the tipping point. Hi there, it's WAMC News Director Ian Pickus, and on this episode of the WAMC News Podcast, my conversation with Anne Maria Wad, a reporter with Colorado Public Radio who covers the marijuana industry. Anne Maria Wad is also the host of the On Something Podcast. Colorado has had legal recreational marijuana for almost a decade now. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm actually uh, originally from Buffalo, so. Yes, I know you go back to our friends at WBFO, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, what what led you to leave New York? Oh, I mean, I started out in public radio. Um, so I lived in New York City uh, when I was going to journalism school and um to kind of get your start in radio, it's usually a really good idea to move to a small station um, and kind of work your way up from there. So I left in 2014 um, to go work in Baton Rouge, Louisiana for a couple of years. Um, And then I ended up in Colorado. Um, And that's where I am now. (laughs) So what are we about to get ourselves into here in New York State? Oh, that's an interesting question, considering there are a lot of elements um, in this bill that I haven't seen in a lot of other places. Um, So in some ways, your guess is as good as mine. But I can talk about um, the fact that New York is just kind of coming out of the gate with some things that have taken us a while to agree on here in Colorado. Um, So, for example, the idea of like tasting rooms, um, that is a a bill that had been introduced in the legislature, I think, a number of years in a row and had only passed last year. Obviously, because of the pandemic, it's really not being implemented right now. Um, You know, delivery is baked into this law. Um, We only very recently passed delivery in Colorado as well. Um, And so it is one of the really fascinating parts about my job as somebody who covers this nationally is sort of watching each state kind of pick up new lessons along the way from the states that came before them, like us, Colorado. It was kind of explicit with uh, New York's fact finding mission over the past several years. You know, many people took trips to Colorado, as did uh, officials from Massachusetts, to learn, you know, how things went out there uh, first. Um, That's right. That we are we are the legalization regulation uh, destination. <laughs> Has it worked in Colorado the way it was expected to? Uh, you know, back when legalization was was finally allowed about a decade ago. Well, I guess it depends on who you are and what your expectations were. Um, I think that there, uh, our upcoming season is about this partially. Um, so New York is joining the club with other states like Massachusetts and Illinois and California who are baking social equity measures into their legalization um, laws. So what this means is that they are at least trying on the front end to create some advantages for people who have ex- historically been harmed by cannabis enforcement. Um, here in Colorado in 2012, uh, that was not a part of the language uh, that voters approved. And the effort to squeeze some type of equity into the industry um, has been a really long uphill battle. Um, And we are actually working on uh, a whole season about social equity laws, but specifically an episode about Colorado and our sort of like internal nickname for this episode is like what took so long. Um, because it really was in 2020 that we finally passed some legislation that got at some of these equity issues, um, if even in just kind of like a limited way. Um, so I think in that way, yeah, like we're, I'm sure that that is probably the biggest, uh, lesson that people take away from Colorado when they come here. Um, because, you know, in the entire state, I believe there are two to three black license holders, in the entire cannabis industry here. Um, And what you are really starting to see here in recent years is uh, a bigger and bigger share of the industry is taken up by these larger companies that operate multiple stores in multiple cities. And um, you really don't see as many like mom and pop shops here anymore. Um, And so the industry here is is kind of like in this adolescent phase where it's starting to sort of consolidate and um, because of that, it's, it's getting even more exclusive. It's getting even more... Uh, difficult to get into this industry. The price for entry is getting higher and higher. Um, And so it's encouraging in a way to see more states like New York um, recognize this as an issue and try to bake it in on the front end. 
I want to run through some of the issues that have surrounded uh, the debate here in, in New York State over the past few years with you. Um, we're having a, a little bit of deja vu with uh, a discussion, you know, also about a decade ago about legalizing uh, casino gambling in New York State. And there were um, sort of grand promises made about the economic impacts it would bring to the state and also the threat of encroaching casino gambling from nearby states, New York feared losing those gambling dollars to uh, next door competitors. And as it turns out, at least in recent months, um, that industry has not reached projections and has struggled along during the pandemic to a certain degree. Um, So I guess my question is, when it comes to marijuana legalization, New York has cited uh, a lot of the same reasons to to, um, legalize marijuana. And uh, does the industry actually keep growing in Colorado from your perspective? I mean, are you seeing, you said it was in its adolescent phase, but Mm -hmm. uh, have projections been reached? Well, so that's actually a really interesting question considering um, we have caps here in Colorado. Not statewide caps on the number of licenses, but at least here in Denver, um, which is obviously the largest market, um, we are capped at something like a little over 200 licenses here. Um, And that cap is being temporarily lifted Um, as a part of some newer regulations that are getting passed in Denver. But uh, I don't, I I think like the projection was sort of that the cannabis industry was going to be limited in this way, Um, at least over here in Colorado. Um, I don't know if there are any caps that are built into that that law in New York. Um, Something that I do see in there that's pretty encouraging, though, is the 50% requirement for social equity applicants. Um, No other state so far has been that aggressive. And I think if you're making the parallel to casino gambling, again, it's been a really long time since I've lived in New York State, and especially being um, from upstate near kind of like the Niagara Falls region, I, I know I know this to be a historically hot issue. Um, and I want to <laughs> provide the caveat that I'm not really up to date on it. Um, but I think, you know, casino gambling is definitely an example of an industry um, where there are unique opportunities for certain communities, um, like indigenous communities, to get ahead. And I think uh, part of not legalizing statewide is to preserve that advantage for them. Um, again, I know that there's many more complex factors than that at, at, at play here, and, and, and I'm not up to date on the issue. But I wonder, when you say they use the same arguments, like, what do you mean? The tax revenue, mostly, right? Yeah, basically, other states around New York forced New York's hand uh, to, yes, yes. you know, go ahead with legalized sports betting, to go ahead with casino gambling. And now I'm talking to you from Albany, New York. Mm-hmm. If you drive on I-90 uh, in the city of Albany, you'll see billboards saying, you know, 40 miles east, you can come to Berkshire County and you can go shopping at a dozen different marijuana stores and be back yeah, in yeah. Albany for dinner. And so, you know, just the borders kind of crept in a little bit. Yeah. And I I, I can definitely um, draw a parallel to Colorado as well. Um, I mean, our our last border town down south right before you hit New Mexico is Trinidad. Trinidad uh, is the next the first city you hit when you cross the border from New Mexico, which is not a legal recreational marijuana state. Um, And so like the border shops in Trinidad do pretty well. Um, And that is kind of a phenomenon. And I think I think you also have to really, really, really acknowledge the federal piece of this, too. Um, that the fact that we are still handling something like cannabis legalization as a state matter really plays a big role here in, in how how similar these get to things like state gambling uh, laws. Like, so obviously the tax revenue is the big carrot, right? Um, carrot and stick for legalization. Um, and I think, I think you had asked uh, about expectations in Colorado. And A really interesting thing to note in Colorado is that before 2012, uh, when we passed it, uh, it had been on the ballot a couple of times. And in previous iterations, it did not have this language that said a certain portion of this money, this tax money, is going to go towards schools. The ballot initiative that succeeded did have this language that said the first number, X number of dollars um, will go towards public schools. Now, I think when we talk about expectations, a lot of people, that was their decider. A lot of people who otherwise were not sold on the idea of legal weed um, care about schools, right? And so they voted for this because they thought, you know, we have a school funding problem in Colorado and uh, this could be something that helps. Well, 
I actually started in Colorado as an education reporter before I did cannabis reporting. And I think the thing that you find a lot when you talk to people is they have this inflated sense of what legalization has done for public schools. Um, you know, several years out, we still see like a uh, a big gap between us and other surrounding states in terms of the per pupil funding on education. Um, and I think you also come to understand that that school funding provision in there really had a lot of strings and fine print that people just didn't understand. Um, and they didn't fully understand what they were voting for. Um, so I think that's a that's an important expectations thing to point out. I think if we're also talking expectations, you want to talk about California and how, you know, their initial projections for how much money this was going to bring in fell short. Um, I think that it's really important to point out to folks that cannabis uh, sales are obviously big revenue generators, but they are not silver bullets for a lot of these other bigger, more systemic, years-long funding holes that need to get filled at the state level. Um, and I think uh, this comes at a time where people are really looking at this as a, as a big budget saver for state budgets, obviously, given what has happened in the last year. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know if that's realistic, just what we've seen in the last several years in terms of um, this this type of tax revenue meeting expectations. Um, and then at least what you see here in Colorado is the, 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 the amount of the money in the bucket that kind of goes to public education is really not that big, like when you consider it as part of the overall education budget. And then the remaining revenue, every legislative session is sort of like sliced up into even skinnier pie pieces and kind of allocated to different programs. So it goes places. Um, but the extent to which it goes to schools, I think people really think it makes more of a difference than it actually does. Since you've brought up uh, the issue of schools, um, let me ask you this. Opponents of the uh, bill in New York State have said, you know, marijuana is a gateway drug and uh, legalizing it will make it easier for young people, uh, impressionable people to get their hands on marijuana. Have you seen any evidence of, of that uh, in Colorado or other states you've looked at actually coming to fruition? In Colorado, we have had much bigger fish to fry, so to speak. Um, I think the bigger issue, for example, uh, in years past has been nicotine vaping um, and the extent to which cannabis is a part of it. That is another story that we've been working on. Um, nicotine is the bigger issue. And I think, you know, the gateway drug claim has been debunked enough times that I, I don't know how much I need to go through that. There isn't really a lot of evidence that supports it. Um, but I think like there's there's ways to make both sides happy here. And, you know, there are always going to be people that are not sold on the idea of cannabis legalization. Um, but more people than not are sold on the idea of public education and public uh, awareness. And I think you're going to see a lot more um, success in terms of educating the public really about the dangers of consuming too much, the dangers of sort of um, dual consumption, uh, like with alcohol. Um, I know that that's been a really big public education focus here in Colorado. Um, like if you go into a dispensary here, there's posters about it. There's pamphlets about it. Um, if you're a newcomer to Denver, obviously cannabis attracts a lot of tourists. Um, there are like these newcomer pamphlets, like here's what you need to know. Um I think I think what matters is like, look, yes, we're, we're, we're making a big societal change here by legalizing cannabis and sort of like moving more towards normalizing its usage. Um, but that doesn't necessarily have to mean that that is like uh, endorsing it as totally OK and safe to use for everybody. I think it's really important um, to keep people informed. And I think the, the research that we see around uh, especially teenagers with developing brains is that cannabis use is really not great for them. Um but I, I think that the other side of that debate that is often left out and, and really, really crucial is that we don't have tons of evidence that kids are just using cannabis at alarming brand new rates. Um, we do have evidence that they're picking some of these new regulated products up that are much more potent. Um, and I, I don't necessarily have answers to that. I think the potency debate is a really new thing. Um, and I think if you look at, like, for example, the fact that New York State is basing the taxes on the potency level of different products, um, I've never seen another state do that. So I will be really interested to see whether that acts as a deterrent to people. I don't expect it to. Um, 
But um, I think you see sort of like the potency of products coming more into the discussion um, in response to this kids issue, because that's really where the data tells us that they are using it more is they're using vapes or they're using dabs or or uh, edibles that tend to be more potent than just smoking flour. Well, that brings me to the next area I wanted to go with you, where uh, the District Attorneys Association in New York State and some others have said uh, the driving issue has not been worked out uh, in this package um, that's been approved this week uh, as we speak. So there's a big question about um, how you police people who may be driving, you know, under the influence of marijuana and and in, in a new way they haven't been looking for uh, before. Is there anything that, that you can share from Colorado's experience about uh, distracted driving, um, driving while high, for lack of a better term, and, and how that issue has played out there? Yeah. So I've had a, a saying for the last handful of years that whoever comes up with the cannabis breathalyzer is going to be a very wealthy person. Um, and I will tell you that a lot of companies have invested a lot of money in trying to develop that. Um, but the key issue is that, you know, unlike alcohol, there is not an easy way to uh, measure somebody's intoxication. Um, and I see in the New York law that there is sort of, I believe, like funds dedicated to researching that. Um, and I think, I mean, it's it's interesting who you ask. Um, it's not to say that impaired driving when it comes to cannabis is not an issue in Colorado. I definitely do not want to say that. Um, but I think also you have, um, I'm trying to remember the state lawmaker that said it, I believe it's, uh, people Stokes who had said something along the lines of, you know, police are going to have to do actual policing. And I think there's some merit to that. Um, I think, you know, sort of the dragnet checkpoint, um, for DUIs is what we're used to seeing on highways a lot. Um, and I think there's a real question to how effective, that is. Suffice it to say, it's just not something we figured out. Um, it's not easy to calculate like cannabis blood content. Um, and then the thing that's really difficult with cannabis as opposed to like alcohol is there aren't really clear benchmarks for intoxication for every person. Like everybody is different. Um, there are some habitual smokers that can smoke every day and they, they do not get like stoned or impaired the same way that others do. Um, and so it is a really hard thing to enforce. Um, and I don't necessarily have a good answer for, for how to do it. Um, but I think the way that lawmakers have really tried to get at it is sort of telegraphing, um, like open carry laws from cal uh, alcohol into cannabis. So basically saying like, if you have alcohol in the car, it's gotta be closed. It's gotta be in the trunk. You can't be like drinking from it. Um, it's the same thing here. Um, I think almost every state has this provision now where, if I leave a dispensary with any products, it has to be in some type of sealed bag so that I can toss it in my trunk. I won't open it while I'm driving. Um, but as to the larger issue for measuring blood alcohol content or uh, intoxication, um, the jury is out. The jury is way out. There's No one has figured this out yet. <laughs> Does legalizing marijuana uh, actually increase the number of people who use marijuana? Do we know? I think it does. Um, I, there is data that shows this. I think it goes up somewhat because you have more people who no longer see it as threatening, um, who no longer see it as dangerous. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are waiting for it to be regulated for safety reasons. Um, and so usage will go up. Um, but I don't think it's like gangbusters. Um, I think the data I've seen is like it's a marginal increase. Um, I will say nationally, the data that we have is that the, the fastest growing group of users is over 65, 75, I believe. Um, and so you should check on your grandma. <laughs> well, I mean, that makes sense. You know, medical marijuana was legal first in most places. And, you know, we know that it has uh, pain relieving effects and other you know, and other uses there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And more often, um, from what we've seen from the data, and I, I have like a, an older story I could pull up about um, research into this, is that the people over 65 are really not looking to get intoxicated. They really are seeking out cannabis as like a medicinal uh, thing. And, you know, it's not to say, I'm sure in the last year, the amount of people who are seeking it out just for fun have increased. Um the 2020 was a good time to to try something. <laughs> um, it's definitely true. But yeah, I think I think use goes up. Um, 
but it's also I think you have to remember with use it's like not something like illicit use is really hard to measure because not everybody's being honest um and so that's another thing to remember is like you have people who probably were using it before but now they're they're they can get it regulated um they can get it cheap from a dispensary depending on where you live um and you know I will speak from experience. I can't roll a joint and being able to go to a store where one is just rolled for me is really nice. (laughs) So lastly, are there any things that were a surprise after Colorado legalized marijuana? You know, you have more years of data to look at. Um, Unforeseen challenges or maybe unforeseen benefits that came with legalizing marijuana that maybe New York should be, you know, anticipating a few years from now? Yeah. So actually, we're going to be again, this is going to be a big focus of our next season. Um, So there are a lot of things that Colorado did that other states have uh, copycat that I think really seemed logical at the time. And we've seen like some unintended consequences. So um, one of the things that we're really honing in on is the idea of local control. So most states have some sort of carve out in the law that says, you know, if you don't want a cannabis shop in your backyard, uh, you town, city or otherwise municipality have the ability to say, no, we can ban them. Um, But I think what you started to see is that the cannabis industry started to become very homogenous. So these local control decisions were sort of part of what was getting in the way of more diverse people being able to get into the industry. Um, I think what you also saw here is that the bar for entry into the industry was really high and I think higher than people realized at the time. Um, Making the licenses as expensive as they are, making the application process as stringent as it is, um, makes a ton of sense on the front end for people who really want to keep legal cannabis very tightly reined in and regulated. Um, But over time, the consequence we've seen is that lower income people, uh, people who belong to communities of color, um, are just, you know, boxed out of the industry entirely. Um, And it really does start to become kind of a big money game. Um, You know, we have uh, multi-state operators now in Colorado, I think, in the last recent years, uh, last few years. Um, And this is what you got to compete with, right, is like, you know, you, a small mom and pop shop uh, who maybe can barely afford to get the license, you got to compete with like Willie Nelson. (laughs) Um, And so I think I think I think the biggest surprise is sort of the economy that we ended up creating um, through legalization here. And, you know, I think uh, the previous governor, John Hickenlooper, who was not super sold on legalization out the gate, took a lot of pride in building a really stringent regulatory system. And um, for that reason, other states, you know, looked at Colorado as a model. Um, But I think you're starting to see states like New York recognize that that's an area where Colorado doesn't have leadership, that, you know, we kind of screwed up. Um, So I think this is, again, something about the state by state nature of legalization is, you know, you are watching governments learn and and trial and error in real time, um, one after the other. It just occurs to me, you mentioned this earlier, but, you know, having the state by state patchwork is it's kind of backwards. You know, it's it's what's happening. Um, it's what we have. But the fact that the, the federal government considers marijuana to be a, a criminal possession still is um, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> I mean, it creates so many obstacles. And I think a great example of this is um Another really kind of unprecedented thing that you see in the New York law that just passed is there's carve outs for grants and loans um, for people to get into this business. Right. Because there's no federal backed banking. You can't go to a bank and get a loan. This is another thing that makes this industry really exclusive, um, you know, is basically unless you have the startup cash or you have buddies who are venture capitalists, um, you know, too bad. Um, And so the fact that the government is creating a grant and loan program is really fascinating, especially because the federal prohibition is usually what stops states from doing things like this, is the idea that the the cannabis money is uh, a little radioactive um, because of the federal prohibition. Like I could tell you that we still we do not take cannabis money just like in underwriting on our podcast um, because of concern for our federal license. I think you still have these real, real, real 
issues with the federal government having not acted on this yet. Um, I think these issues have been really outstanding. When you think of a public safety and public health uh, perspective on something as popular as CBD, uh, right? Like there's not a lot of trusted government backed public health information about is this safe to use? What products are are real? What's the difference between uh, the stuff that has a little bit of THC in it, the stuff that doesn't, the stuff that comes from hemp? Um, there just isn't. Um, a lot of like the way that we have changed the law in the last few years has sort of created these like weird glitches and contradictions between state law and federal law and federal law and other federal law. <laughs> um, and so I think like I've been saying this a lot in our recent meetings that we're probably closer to federal legalization than we ever have been. Um, but I don't think that means it's happening like in a few weeks. I think, um, you know, we have had a very pro legalization Congress for the last few Congresses. There's been an appetite to do this on the federal level. Um, and sort of the roadblock has been the executive branch. Um, and that is still, to be clear, a roadblock. Uh, Joe Biden is not in favor of legalizing cannabis. Um, so we still all live in a big limbo <laughs> right now. Um, but I definitely do think that New York moving to legalize after like seven years of trying this is going to shift the center of gravity in that direction. I mean, it's it's New York. It's it's going to be it like it's going to give Massachusetts a humongous run for its money as the biggest legal market on the East Coast now. Um you know, it's we're at over 30 states that at least have medical marijuana now. Um, and I think it's incumbent on the president not only to consider legalizing when you look at these facts, but I think it's also important to look ahead and consider that there are other substances from which we are taking the cannabis playbook and also legalizing. So something we're going to be talking about in our upcoming season is psychedelics. Um, because this is the next frontier of legalization, right? We just, we, the Oregon voters just approved medical mushrooms. Um, and so I think, you know, the, uh, Controlled Substances Act is going to be dusted off and have a, have a good look taken at it, um, over the course of this presidency. But like, to what extent it is, uh, more ambitious or less ambitious than what states have done, um, it's really hard to say. I think Congress would like it to be more ambitious. Uh, I think the president might not. Um, and then to further compound the mixed messages, you have a vice president who supports it too. So who knows? <laughs> no, you took the words out of my mouth. I, I'm reminded of a time when um, you know President Obama was not publicly for same-sex marriage and his vice president, mm -hmm. Joe Biden, uh, gave an interview and said he was. And then next thing you knew, the administration embraced it. Yeah, I mean, I think like... In our um, incredibly wild times, I think it's important and and worthwhile to pay attention to politicians uh, who change their mind about things. Um, I think that's the fundamental point of the job, right, is like representing everybody means that you are going to have to take all sides into account. And I think... This is something that you've seen with cannabis legalization, right? One of the one of the reasons that we have been like a model here in Colorado for it is the previous governor um, was really into the stakeholder process. He invited public schools to the table. He invited concerned parent groups. Um, he invited the cannabis industry at the table and um, really wanted to give the appearance that he was giving all sides equal weight. And um, I think you're probably going to see some version of that at the federal level. Um, especially considering that John Hickenlooper is in Congress now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think, uh, again, it's just, it's so hard to say exactly what's going to happen and on what timing. Um, but I think, I think we're at an unprecedented time and I think it's, I think it's pretty fair to say that New York might be the tipping point. Well, we are living in an exciting times. Uh, Anne Maria Wad with Colorado Public Radio and the host of the podcast On Something. Uh, thank you so much for taking all this time and for sharing your insight. Um, and I hope we can call on you again in the future at some point because uh, I'm just fascinated to see where this goes. Of course. Yeah. Thank you for giving me a call and uh, go Sabres. <laughs> all right. That does it for this episode of the WAMC News Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, I'm Ian Pickus.